one of the parts that most affected me was this different story about what addiction is and what and what causes it. So if you had asked me seven years ago, what causes, for example, heroin addiction, which is something playing out in someone I loved, I would have looked at you like you were an idiot. And I would have said, well, heroin addiction is caused by heroin, right? It's, it's good clues in the name, right? We've been told this story about addiction that's become part of our common sense. It was part of my common sense. I thought I'd literally seen it play out in front of me. So we think that addiction is caused by chemical hooks in a drug, right? So if we, we're sitting here in Shoreditch, uh, where I used to live, if we kidnapped 20 people off the streets of Shoreditch and we injected them all with heroin every day for a month, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts, right? For a simple reason, there are chemical hooks in heroin, their bodies would desperately physically need them, and you know, that's what addiction is, right? Now that story is not totally false. It comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. And they're really simple experiments. Your viewers can try them at home if they're feeling a bit sadistic. You take a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles, right? One is just water, just water, and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine, right? If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly. So there you go, that's, that's our story, right? And clearly that story does play out for some people. But I only began to understand a, a different dimension to this when I went to Vancouver and got to know an incredible man called Professor Bruce Alexander. Who, who did this experiment in the 70s that I think should really change how we think about addiction along with lots of other evidence that's come to light since. So Bruce explained to me, he had been looking at these experiments, right? He was working with people with addiction problems on the downtown east side of Vancouver, area with a lot of addiction. So I think, well, hang on a minute, those rats were alone in an empty cage where they've got nothing to do except use this drug, right? What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park. Rat Park is basically heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of friends, they've got loads of cheese, they've got loads of coloured balls, they can have loads of sex. Anything a rat wants, it's in Rat Park, right? And they've got the, both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. But this is the fascinating thing. Of course, they try both, they don't know what's in them. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water that much. They use it, but none of them use it compulsively, and none of them ever overdose. So you go from almost 100% compulsive use and death by overdose when they don't have the things that make life meaningful to none when they do have the things that make life meaningful. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. Now, to me what that, that showed is, well it showed me many things, but it made me realise you can have a form of suffering, you can think you know what it is, you can think you've seen it play out, but actually very often there will be other things going on, big environmental factors, not the only thing, but very big environmental factors. And actually, I think it gave me the confidence to write Lost Connections because I realised, okay, firstly, if you go and look at the best social science and sit with people who are affected by these problems, firstly, you'll find a different story. And once you find a different story, that opens up a different set of solutions, ones that actually work. So for example, in the year 2000, I spent a lot of time there, Portugal, not in the year 2000, but later, Portugal had a huge drug problem. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is staggering. Every year they tried the American way more, arrested more people, imprisoned more people, shamed more people. Every year the problem got worse. And finally, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together and they decided to do something really radical, something no one had done in more than 70 years since the global war on drugs began. They said, shall we like ask some scientists what they think? <laughs> so they set up a panel of doctors and scientists led by an amazing man I got to know called Dr. Huang Gulao. Um, and they basically said to them, you guys go away, look at the best science, figure out what would solve this problem because we can't carry on like this. And we've agreed in advance, we'll do whatever you recommend. So it just took the idea out of politics. The panel went away looked at Rat Park, looked at loads of other things that I write about in Chasing the Screen, came back and said, decriminalise all drugs, from cannabis to crack, everything, but, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on screwing people's lives up, shaming them, arresting them, imprisoning them, and spend all that money instead on turning their lives around. Massive programmes of support for people with addiction problems. The goal was to say to every person with an addiction in Portugal, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back. And the results in Portugal were extraordinary. By the time I'd been there, it was 13 years since it had begun. It's now 17 years. Uh, according to the best scientific study, this in the British Journal of Criminology, injecting drug use fell by 50%. 
overdose is massively down, HIV is massively down, street crime is massively down. So I think it gave me the confidence to see if you let yourself look at these issues differently, guided by the best science and the best evidence, you, you can actually find better solutions. And that is indeed what I learned when I went on this other journey for Lost Connections, where I ended up traveling an even longer journey, 40,000 miles, sitting with the best experts in the world about what causes depression and anxiety. And people who just have very different perspectives from an Amish village in Indiana, because the Amish have extremely low levels of depression. I wanted to understand why. To a city in Brazil that banned advertising to see if that would make people feel better to a lab in Baltimore where they're giving people psychedelics to see if that would help with their depression and their addictions. And I think, again, I learned just this very different perspective that leads to very different solutions. The core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. You want to be anesthetized, right? If you want to understand why people turn to painkillers, you have to understand the pain, right? There's an extremely challenging line in Marianne Faithfull's memoir, so people who don't know, Marianne Faithfull is most famous for being Mick Jagger's girlfriend in the 60s. Slightly annoying because she's actually better than Mick Jagger, but that's another debate. Um, but she has this very powerful line. She says something like, heroin saved my life because if it wasn't for heroin, I would have killed myself at that point, right? Now, one of the things that's so important, one of the things that I learned through the journeys for both Chasing the Scream and Lost Connections is that so many things that seem like pathologies, that seem like signs of madness, are not pathologies. They make sense. Doesn't mean, of course, that I'm recommending heroin use, right? Obviously. But we've got to understand why people do the things they do, why they become depressed, why they become anxious, why they become addicted. And one of the crucial things about the harm that this, the way we respond to the people I love who've had addiction problems, and, and globally, except in a few places, one of the things that's so harmful about that is if the core of addiction is trying not to be present because you're in pain, the war on drugs says, well, the solution is to impose more pain on them in order to give them an incentive to stop. And sometimes people say, oh, that doesn't work. Much worse than that. It's not that it doesn't work, it's that it makes the problem worse. Our pain makes sense, right? What we've been told for so long, we've been given this pathologized story of our pain, right? We've been told these things are, so I'll give you an example, and actually it's the mysteries, the, the two mysteries that really impelled me to write Lost Connections. When I was a teenager, I went to my doctor and I explained that I, uh, you know, had this, this feeling like pain was leaking out of me. I couldn't control it or regulate it. I felt very embarrassed by it. And my doctor told me an entirely biological story about why I felt this way. He said, there's a chemical called serotonin in people's brains. It makes people feel good. Some people are naturally lacking it. You're clearly one of them. We just need to give you some drugs and you'll, they'll boost your serotonin levels, you'll feel better. So I started taking the drugs and I felt an immediate and huge boost, right? For a couple of months, I felt great. And then this feeling of pain started to bleed back through. So I went back to the doctor. He said, clearly, didn't give you a high enough dose, gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. I started to, by that time, I was experiencing some quite powerful side effects. I was putting on a huge amount of weight, but I'd felt better. Uh, again, the pain bled through and I was in this cycle of being given higher and higher doses until for 13 years I took the maximum dose you can possibly take. At the end of which, I was still depressed, right? I had experienced some boost from the drugs initially, but I was still depressed. And I wanted to understand, well, what's going on here? I'm doing what I'm told to do, right? I also had a therapist. But the bigger mystery for me is why were there so many other people like me? I'm 39 years old. Almost every year I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased across the Western world. Right? And I thought, at some level, from quite early on, although I, I really resisted this insight, I didn't let it into my head very much, I thought, it can't just be a chemical imbalance. Why would it be rising so much if it was just a chemical imbalance? That didn't seem intuitively right to me, but as we were saying, I was very afraid to, to look at this. But what I, I learned is related to the Marianne Faithful thing as well, I think, in an interesting way. So until I was a te when I was a teenager, until I went to my doctor, I thought my depression was all in my head. Meaning, I don't think this phrase existed then, but I needed to man up, right? I was just being weak, you know, I need to pull myself together, fill in your stigmatizing cliche, whatever you want, right? And then for the next 13 years, I thought it was all in my head in a very different way. That actually, it was a chemical imbalance in my brain, it was a malfunction in my skull. 
And what I learned in the research for Lost Connections and speaking to the leading experts in the world on this is there are real biological factors that make you more vulnerable to depression and anxiety for sure, and I go through what they are. But actually, mostly, according to the World Health Organization, the leading body in the world, according to the leading doctor at the United Nations, the causes are mostly not in our heads. They're mostly in the way we're living. So I learned there's scientific evidence for nine causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them are biological, but the rest are social and psychological. They're not just in our minds. They're in the way we live. They're in the way we're taught. They're in the way we interact with other people. And, and that opens up a very different kind of solution to depression and anxiety, very different paths out, which should be offered, it's important to say, alongside chemical antidepressants, which do give some relief to some people as they gave me some relief for a short time. This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Reading books is great, but I've talked about this many times before. Many books are written very inefficiently and should be much, much shorter than they are. Not only that, sometimes you just don't have the time to read a whole book, or you might want to just go back and review the main ideas without reading the whole thing again. This is why I use and recommend Blinkist. It's a great app that takes information from the best books and condenses it to 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. For someone looking to learn, I really think this might be one of the best apps out there right now. I recommend starting with a summary for any book on the Fight Mediocrity Beginner's Reading List, or any of the books that are in my Blinkist library right now. If that sounds good, head over to Blinkist.com slash Fight Mediocrity, or click the link in the description below. You can give it a try for 7 days completely free, and if you don't want to continue, you can cancel at any time. As a Fight Mediocrity viewer, you'll also get 25% off if you decide you want the full membership. Thanks for watching.